Hi, this is Dr. Laura Lowman, continuing with a mini video um, that is part of a series of mini videos on Illumina sequencing. So we just finished talking about sequencing by synthesis, and now I want to talk about making what's called the library. So a library means, you know, in, in common day-to-day -day language would mean, you know, a large building full of books, right? With the idea that I want you to think about the books as units of information. And you could arguably say that DNA, of course, is the ultimate unit of information. And so a library from the point of view of molecular biology um, can loosely mean uh, a pool of DNA samples that contain all the information that you're interested in. And that's how I want you to think about library in this case. The library is going to be a solution or a pool or a sample that contains all of the DNA that you are interested in and in fact has it in multiple copies and it has it um, sort of specialized and organized or bound like a book with sequences that are called adapters. So in order to make the library the first thing you have to do is obtain genomic DNA and that depends, how you go about that depends on the kind of sample that you have. Getting DNA out of you know an ancient sample that's thousands of years old is quite different from getting it out of a live culture of E. coli. Getting DNA out of E. coli is quite different from getting DNA out of a plant or getting DNA out of a sediment sample. So you'll have to figure out how to get the genomic DNA out um, of whatever sample you're working with, you know, by looking around and seeing what other people do. Once you get that DNA out, you're going to cut or shear the DNA into little pieces of defined length. For us, um, that length range is 350 base pairs to 550 base pairs. That's what works well in the sequencing protocol that we use in my laboratory, or more specifically is used by the Hubbard Genome Center at the University of New Hampshire for sequencing of our samples of Vibrio volnificus. Once you've got the DNA into little chunks, you attach important sequences to the end that are generically called adapters. So at the very end, you have what we can call grafting sequences, and these are sequences that are going to base pair with grafts or short oligos. Oligo always means short nucleotide sequence. They're going to poke up from the surface of what are called flow cells, the physical surface on which sequencing happenings in Illumina technology, technology. These grafts that are poking up are called P7 and P5. So the graph sequences that we're going to put on the end of our library fragments are going to be sequences that can anneal or base pair to P7 and P5. Other sequences we're going to add in are what are called the index sequences. And those are sequences that are also referred to as barcodes. And they um, allow us to take the information or the sequence of the index sequence and relate it back to um, a meaningful ID for the actual researcher. So in our case, we might have a Vibrio volnificus strain 100. The index sequences would let us take all the DNA that is from strain number 100 out of a pool of DNA that is actually belonging to 50 or 60 different strains so that we're, we're sifting through and getting just what is relevant to strain number 100. And that's what we call it barcoding. So we use what's called dual indexing in our lab, and that means we're going to have two index samples, and they're going to be called I7 and I5. The next thing that we're going to need to have are sequencing primer binding sites. So to do DNA sequencing, you have to have primers. And we're going to need to actually do our sequencing in four bursts. So we're going to have four sequencing primers. One will allow us to sequence read one. One will allow us to sequence read two. And those are both chunks of DNA that actually come from the original organism. They're what we're interested in. But then we'll also need sequencing primers for the index sequences that I just mentioned. So there will be a sequencing primer for index seven and for index five. And those sequencing primers are going to be used in the order shown read one then i7 then i5 then read two so the i7 is going to tell us um, it's going to be associated with read one and the i5 is going to be associated with read two so there's a little other sequence that's going to be in there like some some adenines to help make things attach together but we're not going to get into that here um, all of these sequences are placed onto the dna fragment through a step of pcr protocols or sequential PCR amplification, and we're not going to get into that either. So here's what a piece of DNA in the library might look like. It's going to be double-stranded, and it's going to be organized complementary and anti-parallel, so 5 prime, 3 prime, 5 prime, 3 prime. 
if we were to look at our little piece of DNA, so in our research this would be something that's not smaller than 350 base pairs, not bigger than 550 base pairs, this would be complementary in here. Okay? So you'll have a top strand and a bottom strand. The um, grafting binding sites are on the ends. So up here we've got the P7 graft binding sequence, and down here we have the P5 graft binding sequence. Note the orientation. Here we've got the I5 sequence, and here the I7 sequence. Those are the indexes. This is where the I7 sequencing primer binds, and the I5 sequencing primer is going to bind, mark that in here, but it's actually going to bind in here. Okay. The read 1 sequencing primer is going to bind in this area, and the read 2 sequencing primer will bind in this area as well. Now there's a thing about the I5 sequence primer um, that I want to point out, and I'm going to, actually this is why I didn't mark it up here. It's that the I5 sequencing primer is actually built right into the piece of DNA that's poking up off the alumina full um, um, cell, which is called the P5 graft, and we'll look at that more in, in a moment. So these this is the layout, and this sequence and this sequence are specifically uh, put there with the intention that we're going to use them to physically attach this strand and this strand, and that's going to happen separately to a, to a surface, to the flow cell surface. So here's a picture of a flow cell, the cartoon of a flow cell. If you were to hold this up and look at it, it would look like a glass microscope slide. But if you were to really look in it, it would have eight little grooves that are called channels or lanes, and within each there are multiple small blocks that um, are called tiles, and that's what we image, as I showed you images in a previous uh, video in this series where you had little blocks, let me get them again, Here, here's a little block, right, and so that's all of, uh, all of this, this is one unit shown at multiple steps over time, but this would be one unit that would be found inside one of these flow cells, okay, in one of the lanes of the flow cells. And if we look in there, what we'll see is the surface is covered with these graphs or oligo, the P7 and the P5 graphs, okay? And so they're all attached by their by prime end. And so you should be able to predict that what's going to attach from the library is the three prime end with the five prime end poking up. So note the orientation. So in order to get our sample onto the flow cell, we're going to need to denature it or melt it, either chemically or with heat. So we're going to need to break the base pairs that exist in here and separate these into single, these two strands into single-stranded DNA, and then we're going to literally flow them across the cell, and wherever base pairing can happen, it will happen. So what we'll see is the P5 graft binding sequence is going to bind here, and the P7 graft binding sequence is going to bind here. And we're going to be left with a surface that's covered with our two strands of library DNA. Okay, and if you, you'll notice here these are no longer in anti-parallel orientation. So we would have to flip these around in order to get complementary sequence in this gray region, which is the DNA of interest. I'm not drawing to scale, it should really be longer. I'm trying to focus on the ends for you guys right now. So that attachment is the base pairing that happens in here. And once you've got that attachment, once you've flowed your library across the flow cell, then you can go on into the next stage of Illumina sequencing, which is called cluster generation, which will be in the next mini lecture.